Hey guys, Desolate Magic here, and I am amped for the final chapter, chapter 12 of the Dominary storyline. We are going to wrap this all up. I'd like to give a special thanks to Wizards for ruining the entire storyline with one single card, and then they had to go and put flavor text on it to just really drive home the spoilers. Thanks for that. You guys suck. Get a freaking clue and stop disrespecting Martha Wells and her work by leaking the ending weeks and weeks and weeks early. You guys suck. So anyway, this uh, just jumps right back into where chapter 11 uh, left off, where uh, the giant frog demon Yargal is attacking the weatherlight. Liliana's launching some kind of big purple spell bolts at him, it ain't doing nothing, just bouncing right off him, basically. And Yargal's claws are holding on to the ship, but, uh, you know, Shauna and Arvad are trying to, you know, slice at his fingers to get him to let go, but it ain't working. Then all of a sudden they hear a noise, and he just spews out acid all over the ship's bow, which smells great. But before the acid could land, that's right, everybody's favorite character, Raph, who is yet to die, but we'll see. He casts a counter spell, a blue light flashes, and the acid cloud roiled against it and turned liquid flowing across the deck. Then he gasped and said, oh, that's new, Joyra. I honestly don't understand that line at all. What, what's new, and why is he yelling for Joyra? Like, did he just suddenly learn a counter spell? I really have no idea what they're trying to get at with that. A rare miss from the Wrath Man. So flaming Grandmother Jaya uh, slides across the deck and uh, burns the rest of the acid with uh, her flames, because that, that's a thing that can happen in chemistry, totally. But then Yargul shakes the ship and just about knocks Shana and Arvad off the bow. Liliana smashes up against the railing and Jaya's like, ah, that's some crap, and blasts Yargul again. Joria comes up from below deck and uh, releases her owl, which mysteriously has some sort of metallic grapefruit-looking object in its claws. So Yargo keeps shaking the ship, and then uh, Shauna and Arvad tumble toward the side, but uh, Raph uh, casts a little, I don't know, we'll just say illusion magic, I don't know, it's not obviously a real object, because he makes a rope appear. Yay! So they both grab it and don't quite go off the opposite rail, which is probably good. So then Liliana almost goes over, but Joyra grabs her, or the other way around, or something, I don't know. Okay, he's shaking the ship, I get it. And Liliana's still trying to, you know, struggle to control the, the panther army, and they're just kind of like slashing away at Yargle's, uh legs because he's really big. Doesn't really seem to be doing much, though. So then uh, Liliana's like, okay, I really hope you got a plan, Joyra, because, you know, she's the captain. So they're like, hey, captain, do something. And she's like, yeah, actually, uh, my owl has one of the mana-charged burners I constructed to use against the stronghold. Sounds like something you would use to cook a pizza, but I assume it's some kind of fire weapon. So Liliana's like, oh, good, uh, is this going to happen soon? Because then Joyra just shouts, everybody brace yourself. So then there was a big blue light flashing, and Yargul seemed kind of mad about it, and uh, the weather light just shook like crazy. And then uh, uh, Liliana's eyes were dazzled, and she blinked, unable to make anything out. Then her vision cleared. Yargul still gripped the bow, and now its gigantic maw was opening. Joyra swore bitterly and added, I should have used all the burners. Okay, what did that do? It flashed blue light and pissed everybody off. Like, what was that, a flashbang? The hell is a burner? So we jump back over to Gideon and Chandra. Chandra, of course, dressed as Chandra the bounty hunter, and Gideon as her prisoner. And then Whisper, uh, the blood liturgist, a.k.a. head cleric person or whatever, uh, was like, hey, hey, like, throw him in, he's a prisoner. And so, fight club time! They're in, like, the fighting arena below the stronghold, I guess, or whatever. So, yeah, Gideon's just gonna, like, beat some ass. So after, you know, a little bit of a scuffle and everybody fighting over a sword and him dodging and punching people in the face and all that, he's like, hey, guys, why don't we all just kind of stop? And then he realized, oh, dementia magic. They don't know what the hell's going on. So he's looking around to uh, team up with anybody who's not, like, completely lost their mind. And he sees two people uh, fighting back-to-back -back and defending each other. He's like, well, that seems, you know, structured. And so he just walks over and says, may I join you? And, of course, the leader says, well, since you asked so kindly, or politely, actually, she said. So Gideon's like, hey, uh, you know, I'll fight with them for a bit, but uh, if there's others trapped in the stronghold who weren't infected with dementia magic, then, you know, maybe we could free them. And then if the weatherlight ever showed the hell up, then, uh, you know, they'd have some uh, assistance. And so one of the uh, female fighters introduces herself and she says, I'm Radha. I honestly don't remember what card she's on. So back on the weatherlight, Slimefoot crawled out of the weatherlight's hatch and uh, he's, you know, having no trouble uh, walking down the deck because I guess he could like stick to walls or something. So Slimefoot leans over the bow and he's like, hey, other people down there who are like, I, I, I don't really understand this. There's some kind of 
undead spirit semi fungus forest creature i, I don't know the, it just kind of patches it together it sounds like bs to me but he's like hey guys these panther warriors ain't doing crap you want to help and they're like uh who the hell are you and he's just like i am slimefoot friend of yxarit that's how you pronounce it i'm sure and then he just tells them oh uh we're on our way to the cabal to kill the demon and then everybody's like kill the demon because that's like their favorite phrase ever and then they're like okay but seriously though we can't help you, uh, but another spirit said, uh, we'll call something that can. And so then the others see um, <laughs> Slimefoot just like talking to someone, it would appear, over the bow, you know, even though it's telepathic. And none of this really comes together. You just kind of kind of go with it. And Liliana tells them, okay, there's something else coming. It's not dead, but it's also not really alive. I don't know what it is. Jaira knew the spell immediately, though. She's like, wait a minute, that can't be Maltani. Remember the, uh, I, I think that was the elemental that she got the uh, seed from to rebuild the hull. Either that or it's the other elemental that got all pissed off when they were uh, digging the hole. I don't remember, but either way, she's like, that's weird because it kind of smells like Yavamaya, and I know that smell. But there was a bit of a tinge of corruption and sourness in it. So it rose up behind Yargul. It turns out it's actually bigger than Yargul. So yeah, they were not kidding. Uh, and they're like, is this some kind of elemental like Maltani, but not exactly Maltani? So uh, it just comes up. By the way, it's Maldratha in case you didn't quite catch that yet. You know, the most obnoxious, overpowered pile of crap in the entire Dominaria set. Apparently it's some kind of weird like incarnation of Maltani. I don't know. They don't really explain it. What they do explain is it comes up and wraps its big old arms around Frago, and he's like, oh, crap, I'm being attacked. Oh, Joyra does at some point yell out, it's Muldratha, the corrupted elemental. So, what, a third elemental sibling, we'll say? I mean, they really messed up all the land around, so if there was an elemental that was supposed to be in charge of that, like, continent or whatever, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what you get. So Muldratha takes a limb made out of rotting wood and corpses, that sounds pleasant, and uh, pries its jaws open, suddenly Yargle, uh releases the weather light. And as soon as the weather light was free, Jorah was like, Hey, Tiana, get us out of here. So as they're flying away, Slimefoot stumped over to Joyra's side. She looked at it, her brow quirking in amazement. What did you do? She asked. It waved at her. He really likes waving. I mean, I, I love this guy. Slimefoot is my new favorite character. Sorry, Raph. Hey, speaking of Raph, he dragged himself up on the rail and says, I'd feel sorry for Yargul if he hadn't tried to eat our ship. And Joyra, of course, replies, yeah, no, I don't feel sorry for him at all, actually. So they're all, you know, dust themselves off, you know, making sure everybody's okay. And then they're like, all right, let's uh, go kill a demon. So back at the stronghold, Chandra's like, you know, uh, Belzenlock's sitting right there. And if he notices me or Gideon and, you know, that we're planeswalkers or whatever, that we have, like, amazing magical abilities... I can only burn so many cultists. Then they'd probably just, you know, kind of swarm me. I know that feel, bro. I mean, every morning I wake up and I just I just think to myself, I can only burn so many cultists. Why can I not burn all of them, damn it? Then all of a sudden, a deep bell-like tone sounded, loud enough to make Chandra stagger and cover her ears. Well, in my experience, it's either the noodles are done cooking or the laundry's done. But uh, in this particular case, Belzenlock stands up and he roars, defend the stronghold. So it must be some kind of, uh, you know, intruder alarm. And Chandra's finally like, oh my God, finally, they're here. Holy crap. So not quite everybody had ran out yet. In fact, Whisper is still there. And uh, a couple guards and stuff, she's like, okay, they're going to see me if I drop the little, you know, wooden staircase thing that goes down into the pit so that Gideon can climb out. And then all of a sudden, Whisper casts some kind of weird spell thing and a black mist just like dumps into the pit and everybody who breathes it just drops dead. And Chandra's like, oh, crap, they're killing the rest of the prisoners. And so without even thinking, Chandra just sends a fire blast her way. Unfortunately, Whisper must have felt like the heat coming, which seems, oh, just a wee bit unlikely. And she dodges out of the way at the last second. So then all the guards and everything start chucking, you know, the little death magic black sphere ball things at her. And she just blasts them all with, like, individual, like, perfectly aimed fireballs and then dodges out of the way before they can even uh, land their spells. Apparently her training with Jaya did work. So Whisper's like, oh crap, and ducks down behind uh, the other Grimnints, which are the uh, guards, I guess. And so she just, like flurries them with with fireballs and most of them are just immediately turned to ash oh you're gonna have to find a better place to hide sister i'm just saying so since whisper was being a little bitch she decided to go over to the uh, stairs and just burn through the chain lock and then uh, drop the stairs so getting could get back up 
So Whisper tries the Black Cloud crap again, but then Gideon's like, ha <laughs> shield, bitch. Bounces right off of his little golden internal aura, whatever they named that thing, I forgot. And then the uh, gray-skinned woman from before uh, throws a knife and hits Whisper. Oh my god, her name's Whisper, not Whisper. <laughs> I've been playing too much Pokemon. Anyway, she puts the knife right through her eye, into her brain, and she dead. So they're just like, hey, Radha, who is the name of the woman, um, you want to come with us and do cool stuff? Because the weather light is here. And she's like, wait a minute, the weather light? That was destroyed. And they're like, haha, Joyra brought it back. Hey, if you know the history, Teferi and Karn are here too. They're pretty great. Want to help us? And then before she could even respond, a bunch more fighters climbed out of the pit and they're like, hey, Radha, will you lead us out? And so they got like a little miniature army and Radha is like, yeah, you have an escape route planned? And Gideon's like, we have something way better than an escape route. A non-escape route. It's a route, but it's not to escape. And Radha's just like, okay, are you going to get something that will rain destruction on the Cabal? And Chandra's like, probably. Or, you know, that's the plan at least. And Radha's like, yeah, I'll come with you. So outside, Liliana's commanding her undead army to uh, take the revenge on the, um, uh, the, the Cabal, even though the Cabal, it turns out, isn't what killed them directly. So uh, they spotted Teferi and Karn, and Shauna's like, oh, there they are. And so they swing past at an extremely high rate of speed, and Raph's like, uh, don't we need to slow down? And then he immediately says, oh, wait, I forgot, Time Mage. And as soon as he said it, Teferi and Karn just appeared on the deck in a blur of motion, you know, with the same spell that he used before, basically. So Joyra and Shauna are doing their best to, like, deflect all the magic and crossbow bolts and just enemy fire that's coming in their way. And then Raph's like, huh, I've got an idea. Boom, creates two clones of the Weatherlight. I mean, if you see them do the illusion, is it really that great? Is it really going to draw that much fire? But apparently it does work. I mean, they're quite dumb, I guess. So Jordan's like, hey, I'll take out the first gate so that our big army of undead can actually get through. Because remember, there's gates and traps and crap. And uh, she has her, oh, we'll drop another mana burner, whatever the hell that is. Mana burn isn't even part of the game anymore. Oh, wait, I guess it was Teferi who said he'll take care of the first gate, so I don't know why Joyra sent in another Mana Burner Owl Bomber thingy, but uh, he caused a bunch of time to happen, I guess, and then the whole entire gate and everything just crumbled into red dust, well, rust, specifically. I guess uh, Joyra's Owl was going for the next wall because it dropped its Mana Burner and the gate exploded. Then if you dropped it right on Yargle's head, why didn't Yargle explode it? Doesn't he have, like, three toughness? As soon as the second gate blew up, Teferi made all the little fragments of stone and metal freeze in midair, and then they swirled into a big tornado and slammed into the nearby guards, which I'm sure felt great. It basically describes any weather in Wisconsin. You just open up the door, you're going to get hit by something. I mean, there's always tornadoes here. So then Liliana jinxes the whole thing straight to Jinxville by saying, this is going well. And then they see a big dragon-looking thing fly out of the volcano. Fantastic. And she's like, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. And then Raph says, uh, yeah, I wish you hadn't said that too. I have a bad feeling about this. I think it's Ergaros. I guess Raph actually does know everything. Or he just rolled a 20 on his lore check. I don't know. So back inside the stronghold, Gideon and friends are all uh, looking for the uh, armory. But it turns out they kind of rebuild and move stuff pretty often. So their intel wasn't quite amazing. So they finally get to where they think it is, and they find about a dozen doors all sealed with heavy chains and some kind of dark spells floating in front of each one of them. So Rada's like, which door? And he's like, yeah, that's a good question. So they're trying to figure it out, and then all of a sudden they uh, just see Chandra blast the living balls off of the first door. Her fire just hits it, just white hot, burns the chains, the, the magic sigils powering the spells and the trap, the door itself, probably part of the doorway. That is how you get through traps in my D&D campaign. So I guess there wasn't anything too important in the first one, so she just steps up to the next door, and he's like, okay, or we could just do that. So the story jumps back to the weather light, where uh, Teferi asks uh, Raph, uh, what exactly is an Ergaros? And just then a huge volley of arrows goes shooting right at him, and he just, like, without even looking, just waves his hand to freeze him in midair. And then, of course, since Raph is just an endless source of, of useful information, he says, I don't know, but the Cabal agent we questioned earlier was really afraid of it. And that's all he knows about it. So he pulls out his little book that he always has on his uh, waist and starts frantically paging through it. Get a smartphone, Raph. You can just Google it. In fact, I just did that. It's Ergaros, the empty one. And so Karn just looks at him and he's like, uh, okay, yeah, pretty sure it's a really super powerful lich. By the way, it's actually not Bells and Lock riding on the dragon. Which is interesting, because they kind of implied it was, but it's not. And then he says, okay, he's, he's like a lich, eh, with the slight exception that he's never actually been human. Thus the name Herberos the Empty One, which, by the way, that's my little aside. So Joyra's, like, sending her owl with one more, uh, we'll just say mana grenade. 
uh, to blow up the last of the doors before the actual stronghold, and the undead are just, like, racing through the other destroyed ones. And she's like, hey, Liliana, can you stop it? And it says, no one wants a necromancer around until they're being attacked by something giant and undead, Liliana thought Riley. I'll try, but somebody should be thinking uh, of another means of attack. Like, first of all, Belsenlock obviously knows we're here because, um, secondly, he wouldn't have sent this thing out here to fight us if he thought that I could just take control of it. So it says she stretched her awareness towards it to, like, sense what manner of creature it was and felt nothing. Urgaros was a hungry emptiness, glowing, or growing closer, not glowing. He probably wasn't glowing. Maybe he was, I don't know. So Liliana, like, touches the chain veil just to see what's going on with that. But it says uh, the Onaki whispered, but she knew she wasn't strong enough to use it again. Not yet. And plus, hello, he's kind of not Belzenlock. Like, you kind of need that to fight Belzenlock, although I don't think she'll be strong enough by then either from what they said in an earlier chapter. So finally she realizes, yeah, I can't do crap. And she's like, hey, guys, I can't do crap. And then her girls just, like, slams into the deck and everybody just unleashes massive amounts of mostly blue magic and it's just doing nothing. It says, uh, like, Teferi, Joy, or Raph, everybody just barrage of attacks and defenses and everything. Uh, but he deflected it all with magic so dark it was like the heart of a dying star. Ooh, I could turn this into a documentary about why that doesn't make any sense. Nobody in the entire history of magic has a knowledge of astronomy that would extend to how stars work, what stars are, or when they collapse into black holes. There's no scientists, there's no like particle colliders that doesn't even make sense how would anybody even have that comparison how would anybody even know that stars die how do stars even work in the planes what even are the planes anyway shauna walked forward and her resistance to magic deflected all of ergaros's offensive spells and flares of golden light because she's freaking awesome and Karn's just like crouched behind her using her as a human shield because of course because he just wanted to get close enough to attack and Liliana cast her own spell hoping all the distractions would let her kill Urgros before it could shield itself. The purple light of the unspecified spell which is the one thing I can't stand from the Harry Potter movies they're literally just like shooting laser blasts at each other it's such bullshit. Oh we know all these fantastic spells and all these crazy stuff with levitation this then teleportation and, like vines and pe pe petrification and now let's just shoot little beams of magic at each other let's not get creative with it or anything let's not use anything we learned in dueling class. I would have lit the room on fire. Maybe that's just me. I would have made it start raining frogs. I would have gotten weird with that shit. But the purple light struck Urgaros, um, but it washed over him, lighting up the joints in its armor. Oh, that didn't work, Liliana thought, and had time to think before the beast's tail slammed her sideways. So Liliana, like, gets slammed up against the railing, which that railing must be really sturdy and a very appropriate height that through all of this, none of them fell off. So Urgaros' spear lifted, probably needlessly slowly and very dramatically, about to drive it down through her body because, oh, she couldn't move, she was too stunned. And then Tiana suddenly landed in front of her because why drive the ship? Her sword flashed and deflected the spear and the dark weapon careened over the rail. Ooh, hope it wasn't a plus five enchanted one. That's expensive. He, he gonna have to go find that. And then Jaya comes up next to him and she's like, excuse me, sir, can I interest you in some flames, bitch? And the fire drove him back and away from Liliana and Tiana. And then they did the fusion dance and became Taliliana. So Karn jumped on his back and grabbed his head and Tiana just leapt after him. Everybody's just like, let's fight this bitch. Oh, I gotta read this part. Liliana pushed herself up, dazed. Who's flying the ship? She wondered. She looked back toward the bridge and saw the green shape of the Thalid. That's right, Slimefoot, gripping the ship's wheel. Oh, that's all we need, she thought. I'd let him drive. He seems pretty competent. I mean, he, I think he's blind, but, you know, whatever. So Jorah finally figures it out, and she's like, hey, um, this is probably a distraction. Belzalok is trying to keep us out of the stronghold, and Liliana's like, oh, crap, you're right. So Liliana decides she needs to direct the undead panther warrior army uh, from down below, like not on the ship. So Jorah, who was probably thinking, well, your magic ain't doing crap, uh, she says, yeah, yeah, go on, climb down the ladders. We can handle her, girls. He ain't shit. Uh, unfortunately, the ladders were broken off in the battle with, I don't know, someone at some point. And so Liliana's like, hey, guys, you got a way to get down? They're like, hey, we have allies. And she's like, oh, cool. There's weird, like, forest creature, mutant, undead, fungus things. Awesome. So they all just kind of, like, make a pile, and she just, like, climbs down them. It's kind of weird. So it says Gideon ran across the shadowy chaos of the Stronghold's Hall with Chandra and Radha. Um, kind of wondered if they found the sword yet or not. Can kind of bear in the lead there. It says undead panther warriors had made it inside and odd-shaped spirits <laughs> and mutants and undead and just, just, you know, all the weird crap from the swamp that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Thalid guy, Slimefoot, recruited. They're all fighting, so, you know, that's good. 
Nice of them to meet up. And it says, I mean, there were just pockets of cultists and clerics left, but their dementia magic had absolutely no effect on the dead. <laughs> Told you, called it. And so Chandra just watches it and she's like, damn, we're winning. Stay focused, Gideon told her. He carried the black blade still in its scabbard. See, I told you they got it. I knew it. See, I told you that's how you get through traps. Just blow them up with a spell. Uh, it actually says that they found the weapon inside the fourth treasury vault, so they didn't even have to blow up that many doors. I would have blown up the rest of the doors just for fun, though, just for the record. So when they reached the outer foyer of the hall, I guess where they thought Bells and Lock might be, a cleric stood there guarding the door with a whole bunch of, like, weird dark haze of spells, and I guess that somehow was holding them off, even though their magic doesn't work on the undead. I don't get it either. I'm just gonna chalk it up to because story. So the cleric saw, you know, the, the obvious people who were probably behind it because they're dressed so weirdly and kept using fire magic and fired some kind of weird, like, net into the air. And then Gideon's like, ha, ah, I've got a shield. And then Chandra's like, ha, ha, fire. And uh, she blasts the, uh, um, uh, the, the fireball, like, right neatly, perfectly through the group of undead and nails the, the cleric right in the chest. The spell fails because uh, the cleric failed her concentration check, which is funny because that's not how D&D &D works. I'm going to keep just comparing this whole thing to a D&D &D campaign. And then she got swarmed by the undead. Take that cleric, you dick. So a bunch of spirits and mutants and undead and, you know, the whole crew, they burst through the door and, uh, you know, Gideon's just trying to stay in place. And then one of them stops for a second. It says it's a familiar bulbous creature and it... Uh, pointed outside urgently and says bells and locks. So I don't know who it was. Obviously not a sapling because they can't talk. So I don't know. And Gideon's like, oh, good. Uh, we need to get out there then and fight him. And it says the spirit turned and gestured agitatedly. <laughs> I don't think that's a word. The other spirits scrambled out of the way to make a path. Oh, good. They had communication. That's smart. So they finally made it outside where bells and lock apparently was, according to the, I don't know, familiar spirit. I really don't know who they're trying to imply that that was. And Gideon's just like, damn like everything's on fire the gates are blown up the walls are blown up like everything's blown up so as soon as gideon sees bells and lock he draws the black blade just then because story even though this is like tactically impossible a new surge of grimnins aka the cultist guard people they poured out of the stronghold <laughs> from where the spirits and the undead had already cleared basically the entire place okay Anyway, Chandra's nuking them with fireballs as usual, and then Radha's, you know, shouting orders to the spirits to get in a defensive formation, because they were really just there to kill Bells Unlock. So Chandra's just like, go, I'm gonna keep burning crap, this is fun, I love burning things, woo. So Bells Unlock swung around at Gideon's approach, then tilted his horned head in recognition at the sight of the Black Blade. That sword is mine, I forged it to kill an elder dragon, Bells Unlock sneered. Let me just correct that. I think that he made up a story about him being the one that originally killed the Elder Dragon, even though it was, like, somebody else that did it, I think. So now even he's believing his own delusions. But then again, he didn't say past tense. He says, I forged it to kill an Elder Dragon, like, in the future. So, like, what Elder Dragon was he going to fight? Nicol Bolas? Ugin? An unspecified third or fifth or sixth one depending upon what story about the elder dragons you believe so then uh i'm just gonna summarize basically he's like give me my sword back you dick oh gideon's having none of this revisionist history crap he yells out out of curiosity do you actually believe these lies you spout to your deluded cultists oh ho, 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 snap so then they just like break this down like boxing match style they're like "Ooh, the black blade is making gideon's hands ache but uh he only needs to get close enough to pierce his flesh but the demon was taller and bulkier and has a longer reach that's right he has he's six foot eight and has a reach advantage but what about the weight class and the oh my god just like just stab that sucker so gideon just charges in goes for a stab and it comes within a breath of bells and locks hide but it says that he smashed him aside and swung his own sword down the blade glittered with dark magic, but Gideon's shield, which really doesn't like magic, glinted gold as it deflected all the spells. Ha <laughs> ha, magic don't work on him, what you gonna do now, bitch? So then they just kind of circle each other, you know, because he's like, oh, okay, this, this guy ain't playing, alright, okay. And then Belzalok said, I smell planeswalker. <laughs> if that doesn't remind you of that one episode of The Chappelle Show, then what is wrong with you? And no, I'm not going to repeat it. So, of course, Bells and Locke asks who he is. And then Gideon's like, oh, I'm Gideon Jura. I came here with Liliana Vest to kill you. And Bells and Locke's like, oh, you, the Gatewatch? How the hell would he have heard of the Gatewatch? That is the most bullshit thing in this entire story. 
I know what's planned for you. It almost seems a shame to kill you now. Almost. Oh, I guess Nicol Bolas, like, told him the name of the... Did they even... Wait, did they introduce themselves as the Gatewatch to Nicol Bolas? And did Nicol Bolas have time to contact Bells and Locke after the events of our devastation? I'm going to say no and no. So I'm still calling BS on it, but at least I kind of get what they're going for here. So Liliana fights her way with, you know, spells and undead assistance to uh, where they're fighting Bells and Locke, and she's like, ooh, I sense the Black Blade. And I also sense that it's worth a hell of a lot more than 99 freaking cents. What the hell is wrong with people? That's a $5 card minimum, if not 10. Seriously. And then Liliana turns to the camera, and she's like, literally, you, go buy more copies of it. What the hell? That card's amazing. So it says, well, she, she realizes that all she had to really do was distract the demon so that Gideon could strike him. So she just says... Bells and lock. So the demon's horned head twitched toward her. Liliana drew power from the dead sprawled everywhere and cast it like an arrow at Bells and Lock. A.K.A. Billy. I keep forgetting to call him that. And of course, the purple bolt struck his skin and did nothing, basically. Uh, but he laughed and deflected Gideon's next stroke without looking. That's... Okay, come on. One little stab and you're dead, dude. I put a little more effort into it. So then he says, you're weak, Liliana, and you always have been. Who but a weak-willed fool would sign a pact with me? I don't even hit I agree to my iTunes terms of service. So she wanted to just, like, drop focus on the entire army of, uh, you know, undead panthers and just nuke this guy. But she knew that even if she did, unless she used the chain veil, which she really safely can't, she's just gonna have to try to distract him. So she just walked closer, hoping to, like, kind of draw him away from the battle with Gideon, which would be incredibly stupid. I mean, nobody's that dumb, but... Then again, I haven't read the rest yet. So she says, the others who signed that pact are dead at my hand. You're about to join them. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest, three out of four, I wouldn't be talking shit if I was the last one. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, and FYI, she adds, you should have left my brother alone. He's like, pff, 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 pff. everything in Dominaria is mine. The corpse of your brother, your home, you, and I use it as I want. And Liliana's just thinking, boy, his ego is so enormous. He probably actually believes that. So naturally, what do you do to somebody with a giant ego who thinks he's, like, tough shit? She says, you're a buffoon and a liar, and all of Dominaria knows it. Ha ha ha! Taunt successful. So he's still, you know, swinging at Gideon, blocking blows and all this crap, and then he's like, oh, you'll beg to serve me before I'm done, and perhaps I'll let you live. But she could tell a little, little tone in his voice that he was getting a little shook. Just a little, little shook. He's getting pretty shook. And so she's like... Let's keep this one going. You should have heard how they laughed at you at Tolaria West. The massive horned idiot thinks we're as deluded as he is. That ridiculous ode. Ode? I think they mean oaf, and ode is a song. <laughs> what? Oh, she literally meant a song because it says, putting every ounce of contempt she had in her body into it, Liliana started to sing a satirical version of the right to Bells and Lock Raph had composed. Oh, God. Raph wrote a funny comedy song about Bells and Locke. Oh my god. If anybody can find that on iTunes, I will buy the hell out of it. Even though I don't use iTunes. Bells and Locke roared with fury, but Gideon took the opportunity to lunge in, but the demon was too fast. He turned back at the last instant to slam Gideon to the pavement. He lost his grip on the black blade. <gasps> Liliana hissed in dismay, but the black blade hadn't fallen to the ground. It had pierced Bells and Locke's hide. Which is literally what they just said it didn't do, but okay, because story. And it hung from his thigh, glinting with dark energy, like that one Ace Ventura movie where he takes the spirit of the knee. I'm sure it looked just like that. Now Bells and Locke's only remaining career choice is to become a guard in Skyrim. Oh, too soon? Hell yeah, it is. Screw you, Billy. So Bells and Locke whacked Gideon out of the way and managed to fling the black blade into his own knee. What a dumbass. That is literally what happens when you roll a zero in D&D 3.5, right there. Well, apparently somebody's got to be controlling the sword when it stabs somebody, otherwise it doesn't really do anything, which makes sense. So, um, he just grabs it, basically. He lifts the sword to drive it through Gideon's sprawled body, which really shouldn't work because he's immune to all magic, but eh, then again, Nicol Bolas got through it, so who knows. And Liliana leapt forward under Bells and Locke's arm and seized the Black Blade's hilt. Ooh, clever. So she must have just straight up used the magic, as it says she gasped as the dark energy jolted through her, using her body to pull the demon's life force into the blade. Which they stated in an earlier chapter would not work because he's a demon and doesn't have a soul, and this is a soul drinker, but we'll go with it. Belzalak froze, trapped by the blade's power, held immobile, his fanged mouth open in a rictal grin? Rictal. That is one letter away from rectal, okay? Like, 
if there's ever an adjective, some obscure, weird, ooh, I have an English degree adjective that you're gonna throw in to sound fancy, maybe not Rictal. So as he's getting absolutely destroyed by the blade, she barely manages to say, you should have left Josu alone. Oh, bitch, you would have killed him anyway, come on. So she just chucks the blade away because it's like going freaking super dark old lightsaber crazy. And uh, she's like, hey, my awesome purple tattoos are still here. I thought they would disappear. That's weird. And she's like, okay, maybe just because all the signers of the pact were dead doesn't mean that it's going to be as if the pact never existed. I don't know. So Gideon pushed himself up to a sitting position. He's like, hey, Liliana, are y'all right? And she's like, oh, I'm magnificent. So back up on the weather light, apparently Urgaros had just simply vanished when Pelzenlock died. That's convenient. You know, for like at least three primarily blue mages up there, I guess none of them thought to turn him into a frog, which is literally my solution to basically everything in all of magic. Seriously, turn to frog is the like rubbing alcohol of the magic world. It works on everything. Oh, for future reference so that you don't get this wrong, they weren't 100% sure if, if Urgaros, like, died or if he was just, like, freed and just sort of went away to pursue his own whatever. So a bunch of the, like, rebels, freedom fighter people, a bunch of more spirits, just everybody was just like, let's have a party. So they, uh, well, they just went in Stronghold and they, you know, fought the couple remaining people and released all the captives and, you know, disarmed traps and all that crap that you do. Oh, and apparently Teferi knows uh, Radha, and he's like, wow, that's weird that she'd become a prisoner, because she's freaking awesome. So the Weather Lightning crew would be uh, taking her back to Keld, and then drop off any other former prisoners who wanted to leave Urborg, which, no, I want to stay. This place is great. I mean, I heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true or not, that it's free real estate. And then, of course, they got to drop off Slimefoot and its children and Yavimaya and all that, but they're going to be traveling without, get ready for this, Karn, Teferi, and Jaya, who had decided to accompany the other planeswalkers in their effort to destroy Nicol Bolas. That's right, Jaya, Karn, and Teferi are going with them. Whoa! So Jordan was like, hey Tiana, you probably want Sarah's, you know, entire realm back, right? <laughs> you bring it back to the Church of Sarah, aka the Power Stone powering the engine, and she's like, well, you know, there are some evil clerics still trying to cling to power all over, and, you know, it might take a couple years to, uh, you know, go kill them all. Just saying. So Jaya melted the front doors of the stronghold closed and Gideon was giving Teferi the Gatewatch oath and then he accidentally read the wrong one and now him and Karn are married. And Karn and Jaya had agreed to you know, join the fight against Bolas, but they hadn't agreed to take the oath. Karn because he meant to leave soon to continue his effort to destroy New Phyrexia, duh. And Jaya because as she said, I'm not a joiner. Way to show everybody that not just men fear commitment. Oh, so get this twisty little twist. When they were ready to, like, leave, basically, <laughs> Dominaria, or as Liliana puts it, she's totally ready to be done with Dominaria, Gideon has the black blade slung over his shoulder, tucked into its scabbard and wrapped in canvas to hide it. It still radiated dark energy that Liliana could feel in her bones. So they're keeping it to fight Bolas. I thought the agreement was just to use it once, but hey, what are they going to do? Put it in a museum? Put it on eBay? Oh, hell yeah, I'd put it on eBay. Are you ready for the big surprise ending that was ruined like a freaking month ago? Gideon left first, planes walking away in a, in a storm of golden light. Then Chandra and Jaya went out in a brief conflagration of red flames. Then Teferi in a blue whirlwind. Karn simply vanished with a sharp metallic sound, which is the coolest way to planeswalk ever. And Liliana still stood on the pavement in the deserted court. The smoke-tinged breeze stirring her hair. She stared down at herself, baffled. She had meant to follow Gideon. She tried to step out of the plane again, but again, nothing happened. Oh, I might. Have you tried turning it off and then back on again? Reboot the old planeswalker spark there. And then she's like, did I just lose my spark without realizing it? Had it been in the black blade or did I use the chain field too many times? What the hell happened? Then she saw the dust in the court rise and swirl into a whirlwind. A dark form grew at the center of the maelstrom. No, she breathed as, as sick realization settled on her like iron chains. Oh no. Nicol Bolas materialized out of the darkness, his huge scaled dragon form looming over her, the sheer weight of his presence drawing all the light and air out of her world. What are you in love with them? Get over it. You really should have read the details if you're packed more closely, Liliana. You seem unaware that with your demons dead, your contract defaults to its broker. Me. Seriously, bitch, you didn't read that thing? You didn't read it. You did not read every word of it. Are you dumb? 
She just scrolled to the bottom, clicked I agree, and woo, I've got purple tattoos now. See, I came up with all this clever crap, like, oh, maybe, like, they traded and the Bells and Lock actually transferred it. No, it's just, oh, this happened because I said so. So I guess you could say my theory wasn't 100% wrong, but it was like 90% wrong. So she realizes, oh crap, that's why I still got the tattoos. Damn. So this is completely illogical with what I know about the pact, but okay. He's like, oh yeah, you got to do exactly what I say. And she's like, huh, what if I disobey? And he's like, no, if you disobey my orders in any way, the pact will kill you. It will age you hundreds of years in a moment. Because remember, the whole pact was like to stay young or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, that, that would be bad. Kind of odd that that wasn't anywhere in the pact and the demons never like did that or called on that clause. Or that it's completely made up and utter bullshit. Ooh, drama. Now the Gatewatch is going to have to fight Liliana. Oh, no. So she planes walked away with him to who knows where, because he's like, we got work to do. So the rest of the gang uh, planes walk to what I presume is Ravnica, and uh, they're like, where's Liliana? And they're like, well, maybe there was like a trap. I mean, Ergaros wasn't really truly accounted for. I mean, maybe he vanished, maybe he didn't, maybe, I don't know, something. So Gideon's like, uh, I'll go back and check, and then, oh, here comes Jace with the don't bother. I told you she can't be trusted. She never intended to come with you. No, Jace, Gideon shook his head in frustration. She wouldn't do that. She's changed. And Chandra's like, yeah, Jace, quit being a dick. She wants Bolo's dead, and she's now our super weapon. And then she reminds him that she specifically just said like 60 seconds ago she wants to make his corpse dance if there's anything left of it. And Jace is like, nope, nope, nope. She used you, she used me, she used everybody. Whatever she told you was a lie. Mm -mm. But then Teferi's like, nah, she had plenty of opportunities to betray us, yet she risked her life for us over and over and over. So they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Jace is not convinced, and he says, so much has happened to her already, which I can't wait to hear about it. If you're going to have a chance against Polis, we have a lot of work to do. Now nah, to stab him in the foot with the sword. The Black Blade is the ultimate weapon. I'm telling you guys, buy up every copy of Black Blade. So Gideon uh, travels back to Dominaria real quick, and then he's like, yeah, I sense her Aether Trail, but it's going away from here. That's weird. So he was starting to wonder. He's like, did she really bail on us? Like, is Jace not, you know, just mad about it? But then he's like, yeah, but she, like, waited around while we liberated prisoners from a stronghold, and, like, it really didn't add up. So he's not really convinced. Here's what I'm not convinced of. If now planeswalkers can magically sense each other's aether trail, wouldn't he notice that nickel frickin' bolus showed up here and then planes walked away? I feel like that would leave a pretty damn big aether signature. What the hell? That is the biggest plot hole in this entire storyline by far. It's so big you could drive a truck through it and then a dragon apparently, but Gideon wouldn't notice. So he's just like, okay, wherever you are, Liliana, I hope you know what you're doing, and I hope that we see you again. And then he planeswalk backed out of... I can't even read it. He teleported up out of that crap hole. And that's the end of the story. So what are they going to do on Ravnica to fight Nicol Bolas? And what kind of trap did Nicol Bolas have on Ravnica? He obviously didn't turn on the Immortal Sun because he himself could planeswalk out. And like I said earlier, I don't think he's using it to block planeswalking, I think he's using it to amplify his own magical powers, because that's what it does, anybody who touches it. Whatever, we'll see. Hopefully he dies in the third part of uh, the Ravnica, we'll just say block, because that's pretty much what it is. And I'll see you guys next storyline.